Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Welcome to this episode of our signature executive exchange series, Wisdom of Wealth, Wild Talk. Now, last year in June, Mark Zuckerberg actually rebranded his entire company and called it Meta. Now, Metaverse, of course, is a buzzword, but what does it mean to us in our physical world? What impact does it bring to traditional wealth and wealth ownership? Today, we're very honored to have Mr. Yatsu, co-founder and executive chairman and managing director of Annie Market Brands here with us today. He is, of course, one of the key participants in the entire sector because he drives digital property rights through NFT and gaming and to help build the open metaverse. And with us on HSBC side, of course, we have Ms. Maggie Mim. Again here with us, Ms. Maggie Mim is the head of wealth and personal banking of HSBC Hong Kong. Thank you once again for both of you guys to joining us today. I was told, actually, somebody was telling me a little bit about your background. So how did you become a um, metaverse guru? I think this, the journey is probably similar for a lot of people, which is that you don't know what you will end up being in some ways. Mm. If you go towards a path in which you feel that you have purpose and you think it's important, yeah. Sometimes you don't know where life will take you, and it's almost impossible to know. Uh, and the way I got into technology was actually an indirect way through music. I wasn't a very gifted musician in comparison to many of my fellow students who were clearly better. And music is one of those things where you can tell who's really good or not. And the fact that I actually was studying music, none of that mattered in this virtual online world where people from all over the world were communicating with me, appreciating what I was offering, right. which eventually led to a job at Atari. Mm -hmm. So the way that we describe, and there's, a, there's some distinctions between a closed and an open metaverse, but at the end of the day, regardless of what it is, it comes down to ownership of data and control of data. So in the physical world, valuable resources are defined by energy or oil, maybe real estate or these things. In the virtual world, the resource is data. Data powers the metaverse. It has powered the early days of the internet, which you could call a kind of pre-metaverse, but ultimately all of our digital experiences come from that form, which is data. Yeah. Now, our definition is that the metaverse isn't VR or AR or all these tools. You can use them to experience the metaverse. They are interfaces. Mm. But the actual most important thing about this is basically true digital property rights. Mm. So if I don't have ownership in this space, mm. if I don't have control of my sort of data, that means I don't have a digital identity. Mm. If I don't have ownership in the real world, then who am I? Mm. I don't have an identity. It doesn't matter that I have a you know, nice experience, but from us, our perspective, that's why in the real world, though, you would have ownership. It's your house, it's your family, it's your identity, it's your property, it's your ownership. These things don't just define your roles in life in terms of what you have potential value for. It also speaks to who you are. Where I live and what I wear, what I do, are part of my identity. Our version, our feeling of the internet today is that most of us are like that too. Mm. We're existing in the digital world, but we don't actually own any of it. Mm. We don't control it. Who controls the time and data that we give to the, to the Facebooks of the world? Mm. So the thing we think of is that when you're using Facebook, many people think I'm using it as a service to benefit from its social. We think that we're all working for Facebook for free mm. because Facebook derives billions and billions of dollars of value, as we all know, mm. from the data that we give them. Now, if we all stop using Facebook or Instagram, what is the value of Facebook? It's nothing. Yeah. So why are we not getting value, fair value for it? So what they've done is, through, I would say, this amazing, call it um, trick, shall we say, made us believe that using Facebook for free is a benefit to us, when in fact, they are the main beneficiary of it all. And it started this way because in the early days, the internet and technology was an add-on to life. Mm. It was, you know, maybe we spend a few hours a day in this and therefore it's no big deal. Yeah. But think about your life today. What's the first thing you do in the morning? Check our phones. Yes, check your phones, mm. go online. What's probably what you do most of the day. And what's probably the last thing you're doing during the day. And how do you communicate with most of your friends? It's entirely digital. Yeah. So I would argue that our digital dependency is actually become the majority of our life. Yeah. But that Instagram handle that you have a million followers on, it's not yours. That virtual item that you, you know, paid for that is in your game is not yours. None of it is yours. And so when we say the open metaverse, which is the difference between the closed metaverse, which is something like what Facebook is looking to build, we think essentially the open metaverse is all about true digital property rights. And the experiences around you know, you know, AR and VR 
is basically how you can experience the metaverse, but it's not the metaverse in and of itself. I do have some interactions and experience with the early stage of DeFi, but it's a passbook version, you know, the passbook account version of Yetzil's bank account. My experience with um, DeFi, blockchain actually, mm -hmm. is in my last venture when we developed a blockchain-enabled supply chain finance. Mm -hmm. And the whole discovery and development of that actually made me realize the power of traceabilities. When you have traceabilities, you create accountabilities and therefore you also have trust. So that's the first level of you know, tokenization and blockchain capability. Now, things have evolved in the last 10 years and it's now taken into what Yasu was talking about, which is the high ground of the whole technology behind is to respect your ownership right, you know, your digital right, mm. and get back to the creator of what they deserve. And it's all coming to, if I can say anything to, about my previous adventures with this, is it is also traceability as well. Mm -hmm. Because you can trace, that's why you can give back. Well, so first, Non-fungible tokens, by definition, simply mean that they are tokens that have a scarce attribute. It doesn't mean specifically anything else other than that. But the representation of the scarce attributes of NFTs means that they can mimic all the effects that we have in the real world. So for instance, when you buy a wedding ring, the wedding ring in itself is fairly fungible when you buy it from, say, a jewelry store. But the moment you own that wedding ring, it is uniquely yours. Mm -hmm. And it is also unique to the person you give it to. And that story of that wedding ring becomes a part of your identity. It is entirely non-fungible in nature, even though the qualities of it, you know, the material, the gold or the silver it's made of, is probably exactly the same as every other wedding ring in the world. So one way to think of the sort of digital identity that happens with non-fungible tokens isn't that it's a, is that the only use case. It's the fact that it enables the kind of experiences that are human to us, making the metaverse closer to our actual human experiences. So it's not just the utilitarian function of, well, can I trade it? Can I function this way? It's actually about the human aspect, the emotional aspect. Just like when we buy real estate, when we buy a house, we don't just buy the house because we think it's valuable. That could be one factor, but we buy the house because we like the neighborhood, because maybe my family is close by, or maybe my kids go to school there, or it says something about me or about my status, right? Many more emotional and personal decisions go into all of our purchases, from clothes to everything else there, and non-fungible tokens represent this. So think of this a little bit like if you were a bank. Every transaction you do is always on the ledger. You know, you may not know who it is, but you know what's happening with it. That level of transparency may not be comfortable for everyone, but if you can participate in this, I think you, know, you can audit it, you'll have a greater understanding. So I think the secret of sort of succeeding in a DeFi and decentralized world is to understand how to navigate and read on-chain transactions, uh, which is frankly, to me, no different than understanding Excel you know, you know, for, for accountants in you know, the last generation. First of all, they there are a number of generations uh, that HSBC has clients of. For the last generations, I think they look at the new economies mm. as a hedging. Yeah. So very much to what Yasu was saying, mm. you know, risk off, diversify, <coughs> um, so that I don't want to miss out. Yeah. The newer generations appreciate the value of metaphors to the extent of the purpose. The purpose is to protect digital ownership. And that's what they are, to a certain extent, because of this purpose, they are also thinking that they want to partake in it. So that's the, the newer generation. That's to the wealth piece. There are also the mass retail who are participants mm. of Metaverse, right? Yeah. So, and HSBC happens to have a lot of mass retail customers as well, which is why we have sessions like this, because in a way, it is also for us to reach out to our customers, educate, engage, awareness. But there's an opportunity for the banks mm. because at the end this capital formation as a service provider for that is actually where you could play an important role yeah. because what's the difference between providing financial services to physical versus virtual property? But In what's fact, the role that you see financial institutions play? Well at the end of the day you know, we still live in physical worlds. As much as we exist virtually, we still eat and sleep and drink and pay taxes, you know, in the physical world. You are the bridge to that, right? And the other thing is the financial services component is very important. You provide a level of trust to an institution. You know, we don't think, for instance, that regulation 
is not going to exist in the metaverse. Regulation will still be there. These things are important and you have an advantage uh, with that. And again, I would say the services that other companies are trying to provide as HSBC, you can provide all of these anyway. Physical ownership, if you think about it more deeply, is actually entirely virtual in construct as well. Because at the end of the day, you don't own this house because you physically own the land in some kind of sort of, you know, natural way. You have a piece of paper mm. that is guaranteeing your ownership mm. by a government that you hope and believe will be there forever. Mm. So you've decided to really take a risk on, yes, I believe the Hong Kong government will be here for a long time, therefore the property is real. And in fact, in Hong Kong, it's not even a freehold. Mm. It's a lease. So you're really paying forward value on a lease, hoping that, you know, after a certain number of years, it will continue. So it's actually virtual. In blockchain, this is effectively like a freehold. The ownership of that virtual land is permanent for that matter. Whether it has value or not is a different question, but at least you know you own those digital assets. HSBC, as you know, we launched recently a Metaverse Fund, which has created quite a lot of um, impact and reaction from our customers, so very well received. But that's only the first of many things that we have um, looked into to help our, our customers look for opportunities, emerging opportunities in the new economies. Our customers are all very sophisticated in the old economies, the old e-commerce space but not necessarily in the new commerce space. Um, so that's where um, HSBC, we are using, I think we're using our network, our connections with partners in order to provide those opportunity for our customers, either it's direct investment or indirect investment. Uh, maybe to add on that, I think from, you know, for your, your customers, obviously as a bank, you probably have certain restrictions as to what you can and cannot invest because the open metaverse does run mostly on chain. Yeah. So it's probably probably difficult for, for you to, you know, <laughs> sort of look at tokens, for instance, uh, or virtual real estate at the moment. But I think as time goes on, that's a capability that you probably can develop over time. And I would probably look, uh, sort of recommend that when you are ready for this, when you know regulation and everything is at this point, you should probably look towards some of your younger, sort of younger members at HSBC, <laughs> because that is actually their world. They're the ones who are most excited about this. They understand it, yeah. and you know, investing in the open metaverse is very similar to sort of understanding the culture of that. So it's the, sometimes I give this similar parallel to like China. Someone from outside of China would like to invest in China, you know, especially when China was growing as rapidly as it was, but they don't understand it. So investing from the outside is really hard. Right. So you want someone who lives there and understands the culture to participate. And in the metaverse, that uh, you probably need to find the same kind of people, which I'm sure you have probably in your organization. Well, I would like to once again thank Yatsu for taking time from his very, very busy schedule uh, to spend time with our staff, our clients, um, share about his vision of um, Web 3.0 and also um, a little bit about Animal Co brand. I mean, from, it's quite obvious that HSBC has a huge platform and like what Yasu was saying, we can be the bridge between the new and old. <laughs> yep. uh, so we look forward to any opportunities we can to help our clients to achieve, to stay ahead and to look for opportunities in the new and old economies. As you can see, Yasu is a prominent example of somebody who look ahead and stay ahead. HSBC has a rich platform and we are best placed to serve our customers to look for opportunities ahead of games and bridge the old and the new economies.